Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us here at Tribe Public. Excited to have uh, the team from Chinook uh, Therapeutics. Uh, um, it's a company that trades on the NASDAQ symbol KDNY. Um, I have Eric Dobmeyer, the CEO of uh, Chinook, and also Tom Frolic. If I pronounce it right, Tom, this time, and he is the chief business officer of Chinook. They're both going to present to us today. We're very lucky, and I look forward to uh, uh, addressing some of your questions. Remember, you can send your questions uh, live here through the chat feature uh, on, uh, uh, not the chat feature, or the, on Zoom here. So just push those over to us as you think of them. Uh, but we're going to let them introduce themselves and then uh, pull up a PowerPoint present. We'll try to wrap this all up in 30 minutes as usual. And thanks again for coming across the world and joining us. And uh, thanks again to the team at Chinook. And uh, uh, Eric, please take it away. Yeah, thanks, John. It's great to be here. I'm Eric Daubmeyer. I'm the president and CEO of Chinook. And with me is Tom. Tom, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, hi, I'm Tom Frolic. I'm the Chief Business Officer at, at Chinook. I've, I've been with the company since it got started. Uh, my background is um, mostly in big pharma on, on the commercial side. I spent about 20 years between Merck uh, and then J&J, &J, uh, most of that time in strategic marketing, uh, launching products in Europe and then globally, uh, and then worked in business development before moving into the, the biotech world. Thanks, John, for hosting us today. That's Great. Right. So I'm going to share some slides and do an introduction, uh, an overview on um, Chinook, and then Tom is going to talk about our lead indication uh, and some of our products focused on primary hyperoxaluria. I'm sorry, focused on uh, IG nephropathy. So let me just go to the beginning of this presentation. So Chinook is focused on precision medicines for kidney diseases. We are a company that uh, became public about six months ago through a reverse merger with Aduro Biotech, and we very quickly pulled together a very strong pipeline of kidney disease therapies uh, focused on rare, severe kidney diseases. And I, we will be making some uh, forward-looking statements today. Please refer to our SEC filings for more information. So my background has mostly been in, in oncology. I was at Seattle Genetics for 16 years and helped build it from a very small company, a little bit smaller than Chinook, up to a $10 billion company with uh, multiple products uh, approved and, and moving forward. And what really attracted me to Chinook is the science, the team, and a number of things, but even more importantly, the unmet need in kidney disease. There is very little progress that's been made in treating this compared to other therapeutic areas like oncology and rare disease. When you look at how kidney diseases are treated now, it's uh, very similar to how they were treated 25 years ago. And it's a huge problem for our healthcare system and for people whose kidney function is declining. Almost 10% of the population globally suffers from a form of kidney disease. And this drives a lot of spending, over $120 billion a year in the US alone. And most of this is on dialysis, transplant, and supportive care. There are very few therapeutic options uh, to treat kidney disease. This is all changing rapidly. We're getting much better scientifically at identifying causal mutations and drivers of disease rather than just looking at a, the disease, looking at a kidney on a slide and saying, this is what it looks like. We're getting better at determining what, what causes the kidney to look like, look like that. What causes the kidney to have um, disease and to have declining function. Uh, in the past, lots of drugs were used with nonspecific mechanisms. They were repurposed from other therapeutic areas. That's all changing now. And we're able to do much more focused trials targeting causal mutations and biomarkers, uh, stratifying patients who are most likely to benefit from drugs. And, and importantly, the FDA now recognizes because there's such a huge unmet need here that they are willing to accept surrogate endpoints in some of these diseases. So instead of re relying on uh, endpoints like progression to end stage renal disease, which can take a decade or more in some of these diseases, they're now allowing us to get approvals based on proteinuria, which is a, a surrogate endpoint that um, measures the amount of protein in the urine. And that can be measured in as little as six months after starting treatment. So this allows us to do much more focused, shorter, more uh, less expensive and, and more effective trials. And uh, that is going to really rev revolutionize this uh, area and allow us to bring more uh, drugs to patients more rapidly. 
So when you look at uh, when you look at Chinook, we've built this pipeline over the last two years through a combination of internal development as well, well as some in licensing and a merger with the Toro Biotech. We have three lead products. Atrocentin is a, a program. It's an endothelin receptor antagonist. So it's a drug that targets the endothelin pathway and it reduces pressure in the kidney. So it has hemodynamic effects that reduce proteinuria. And it also has anti-fibrotic and anti-inflammatory effects. And this, this drug was developed in over 5,000 patients by Abbey in a different indication in, in diabetic kidney disease. And we're bringing it into glomerular disease. And our lead indication is, as I mentioned earlier, IgA nephropathy. We started a phase three trial last month in IgA nephropathy that will read out in 2023 on the uh, accelerated approval endpoint of proteinuria. And we also started a phase two basket trial uh, last week called Affinity. So both these trials are up and running. We'll start having data from Affinity next year in 2022. And we'll start having uh, data from Align in 2023. We've also got Bion 1301, which is a an, an, an monoclonal antibody therapy for IgA nephropathy. It targets the April pathway and we uh, got this drug brought in through the Aduro merger. It has the potential to be truly disease modifying in this disease. And as Tom will tell you about, it can potentially eliminate or reduce the uh, immune complexes in this disease that cause damage in the kidney. So IgA nephropathy is an autoimmune disorder and the patients develop this uh, aberrant immune response that causes immune complexes to circulate and be deposited in the kidney where they cause damage. So we've got some really interesting uh, healthy volunteer data in a number of different trials that we've done uh, showing strong effects on biomarkers. And we reported actually some additional data this morning at a kidney disease conference called the uh, World Congress of Nephrology. And we're currently treating patients and we expect to have our first patient data from this potentially disease modifying drug uh, in June at the uh, conference in Europe called ERA EDTA. We also have our first internally developed program called CHECK336. This is for a disease called primary hyperoxaluria. It's an oral small molecule that inhibits a key pathway in this disease. And we're not gonna talk a lot about hyperoxaluria today, but it's a very severe disease that can cause kidney stones that deposit and uh, eventually cause kidney failure. So it's, it's a, something that often manifests itself in children. There are different variations in terms of severity of the disease. But with the most severe form, patients um, progress to kidney failure within uh, by the time they're in their 20s often. So it's a big unmet need. We're moving through IND enabling studies with this program and plan to start in the clinic by late this year or early next year. And beyond that, we have a very robust research uh, pipeline. Our goal is to build the leading company in the kidney disease space. And that's going to include both internal development as well as in licensing. We have a, a focus on rare, severe chronic kidney diseases, and we're using some of the precision medicine approaches I mentioned earlier to advance this pipeline. And underpinning all of this is a strong cash position. We had $250 million in cash investments at the end of 2020. This gives us operating capital through the first half of 2023. And just to summarize, this is our pipeline with the phase two and phase three for atrocentin that are underway with readouts planned next year and in 2023. Bion 1301 is in a phase 1B currently, and we'll start reporting IgA nephropathy data later this uh, year in June and, and likely as well at ASN in November. And then 336 is moving into the clinic uh, by the end of this year, as well as the research pipeline behind that. And importantly, we have global commercial rights to all our programs. We intend to commercialize ourselves in the US and likely Europe but we're also exploring partnerships in uh, Asia, particularly China and Japan. And, and IgA nephropathy is a much more common disease in Asia. The incidence is about twice as high and there are several million patients with this disease. So it's a, it's a large need there. And we're also looking at additional opportunities to bring into the pipeline and, and supplement our internal research, research efforts. So that's an overview. I'm gonna turn it over to Tom now to talk about the disease IgA nephropathy and um, give you a sense of the unmet need, the commercial opportunity, and then some of our programs. Great, Th thanks, Eric. Um, so IgA nephropathy, we believe, is, is the ideal indication for us to, to be working on uh, within kidney disease. Um, it is uh, considered an orphan rare disease, but it, it is probably one of the more common 
uh, rare disease mm -hmm. with about 150,000 patients uh, in the US. Uh, it's the most common primary glomerular disease. Uh, and like a lot of kidney diseases, there are no <clears throat> currently approved treatment options. Um, and what is used are, are older uh, blood pressure and steroid medications that really aren't as effective as, as, as they do need to be. Now, one of the reasons we're, we're really, I uh, think that this is an, an ideal indication to go after is because as you can see on the right hand side, uh, over the last decade or so, the mechanism of disease uh, has really been teased out uh, by, um, uh, by academic scientists. Um, and when we look at the, the disease progression uh, and the mechanism within IgA nephropathy, it really starts with uh, something called an aberrantly glycosylated IgA. Um, now, IgA is an antibody that is part of everybody's normal immune system. Uh, and it, its job is to, to prevent bacterial infections in the mm -hmm. mucosal tissues, so in your, in your lungs or in your gut. Uh, but what happens in patients with IgA nephropathy um, is that there's a missing sugar uh, in, in, in some of the IgA um, uh, antibodies that are developed. Uh, and this missing sugar actually makes your body feel like it's a foreign molecule. Uh, and what happens here in, in HIT2, which is described, uh, is your actually body actually produces antibodies to those uh, um, antibody IgAs that, that are missing that sugar. Uh, and those bind together and form these immune complexes, uh, which travel through the bloodstream uh, and actually end up depositing on the kidney. Uh, and once those immune complexes are deposited on the kidney, they start causing damage. Um, and the damage actually results in the form of changes in the cellular structure, uh, changes in inflammation and fibrosis, uh, and you really get this progressive disease. Uh, the other thing that happens as a result of this damage uh, is the filtration bar barrier, which filters out the blood into the urine, actually becomes damaged and actually a bit leaky. Uh, and so what ends up happening is you actually end up proteins slipping through uh, that normally aren't meant to slip through into the urine. And that those proteins actually do cause more disease progression. Um, and actually the levels of protein in the urine have been really closely associated uh, with the level of progression of IgA nephropathy. Uh, and because you can take that measurement and relate it to disease progression so closely, um, the FDA and other regulators are now saying, oh, if you can show us that with a medication, you can actually improve levels of protein in the urine, uh, then they can provide at least accelerated approval. Um, and so we're really excited because we can very specifically target different elements of this pathway. Uh, as you can see with 1301, we're targeting uh, these IgA, these deglycosylated IgA. Uh, and with atrocentin, we're downstream looking at these hemodynamic effects with improved proteinuria, uh, but also decreasing inflammation and fibrosis, which re results from, from this damage. Um, the other reason we're so excited as well is because um, by decreasing proteinuria, we can have a very rapid development pathway where we can potentially get accelerated approval uh, in just six months, as opposed to in the past in kidney disease where you'd have to show uh, a really long outcome trial showing you're preventing patients going to dialysis or transplant in order to get on the market. Uh, so it's a, it's a really interesting time to be studying uh, this, this disease. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Eric. Um, so a little bit about, about the patient, uh, their journey and their pathway. Um, these are, are patients that are a little bit younger than your typical kidney disease patient. I think when, when you imagine a, 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 an average patient on the dialysis ward, they're probably a little bit older, they probably have a lot of comorbidities, uh, but this is a genetically driven disease, uh, they think, although they haven't uh, teased up the exact genetic driver, um, but uh, patients in their 20s and 30s are often diagnosed uh, quite, quite early. Um, and this diagnosis is usually follows uh, a chest infection or, or some other type of mucosal infection. Uh, and the patients actually usually show up to their doctor because they have some blood in their urine called, called hematuria. Uh, and the doctors investigate this. Uh, they, they typically, they rule out all of the physical reasons why you might end up having blood in the urine. Uh, and if they've ruled all those things out, uh, then they suspect that it's this, this disease, IgA nephropathy, uh, and then they run a biopsy. Uh, and that is actually what the most typical result of blood in the urine uh, in the biopsy, more than half the patients screened in this way uh, actually are diagnosed with, with IgA nephropathy. Um, once a patient is diagnosed, it is a severe and progressive disease. Uh, it is rather slowly progressing, uh, but it is uh, uh, quite impactful with about 15 to 40% of patients 
uh, developing end stage renal disease after 20 years. So that means their kidneys are failing and they need a, a dialysis or a transplant. Uh, and in the more higher risk patients, so people who have higher levels of proteinuria or faster rates of decline of kidney function, um, half of those patients actually progress to kidney failure uh, within 10 years. Uh, so this is a very severe progressive disease that um, if patients aren't getting uh, the appropriate dialysis or transplant, then uh, it will re re result in, in death. Um, next slide, please, Eric. Uh, the current treatment options though, uh, unfortunately um, are lacking. Um, as, as we mentioned, there have not been any new drugs uh, uh, in this area for, for, for a long time. And in fact, no drugs have ever been approved uh, officially for IgA nephropathy. Um, if you think about the, the treatment algorithm for these patients, um, so once a, a, a patient shows up with that hematuria, so that blood in the urine uh, for, with a physician, um, immediately, as I mentioned, they do suspect uh, that that patient does have IgA nephropathy. Uh, and quite often they'll just put a patient on an ACE or an ARB uh, right away. And these are um, old blood pressure medications that have been around for 40 or 50 years. Um, and they do actually work in reducing proteinuria uh, in, in, uh, to some degrees in, in patients, um, but by no means do they uh, get, get, it, get it all the way down to, to the level that's required. Um, and the target for physicians is typically to get it uh, below 0.5 grams of protein in the urine per day, um, although some physicians aim at one gram. So it's somewhere between 0.5 and, and one, uh, but I, ideally the, the lower, the, the better. Um, and then, so some patients do have control uh, with an ACE or an ARB, uh, but many don't. Uh, and when we did market research, about half of the patients still have higher than one gram uh, of protein a day um, after optimized treatment with an ACE or an ARB. So there's still a huge amount of patients that are at high risk of, of progression, even with uh, this, this therapy. Um, now that's when physicians get kind of in a sticky situation um, because there's really nothing else that's very good uh, for patients with IgA nephropathy. Um, right now, the standard of care for those patients who have failed an ACE or an ARB uh, is a steroid. Uh, and it's nothing fancy, just old uh, steroids that have been around for a long time. Um, and about 30% of the total patient population ends up getting going on a, a course of steroids at some point uh, in, in, their, um, in, in, their, in, their, in their journey. Um, now, the problem is that, that physicians and actually especially patients absolutely hate steroids. Um, they're associated with uh, high levels of treatment associated side effects. Uh, uh, they're really poorly, poorly tolerated. Um, and actually data when they've actually been studied in trials uh, shows very limited efficacy. Um, there is some reduction in proteinuria, um, but over time, there's actually very little effect on preserving kidney function. Um, so, so there's a desperate need for new treatments to be approved in IgA nephropathy. Um, there are a number of, of treatments in the pipeline, uh, but we believe we have two of the most promising that, that we'll describe uh, a little bit later. Um, Eric, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, this is just a quick snapshot of how many patients uh, we believe are, are, are out there. As I mentioned, it is a, uh, a, a very prevalent orphan disease, if, if that's a, not an oxymoron, um, but, but we, we, we do believe that this severe disease, uh, there, there's a, a, a suitable market for us to go after. Um, there's about 150,000 patients in the US, um, a few hundred thousand in Europe. Um, and then because of differences in, in, in background, there's a higher incidence in Asians. Um, and we believe there's several million uh, in Asia. In Asia. Um, so that's really helping drive our, our thinking and our strategy. We believe there's a huge blockbuster market opportunity in the US, um, but we also believe there's a, a global opportunity uh, for commercially for, for this, this, this product. Um, so I'll just gonna very briefly describe our, our, our two programs um, that it, are targeting IgA nephropathy. Um, as Eric mentioned, atrocentin is a, a potent and selective endothelin receptor antagonist. Uh, we're very excited by this because uh, early on our biology team looked really closely at IgA nephropathy and found that endothelin was really closely associated and implicated in the progression of IgA nephropathy. As Eric mentioned, it has effects on the vasculature. It has effects on inflammation and fibrosis. Um, and atrocentin is the ideal molecule to block endothelin. Um, if we look at it on paper, it has all of the properties that you would want in a molecule, 
Um, it's peak molar potency, which means it's extremely potent, very selective, so it doesn't hit other things that you don't want to hit. Um, and then what gets us the most excited is it's exquisitely well studied. Um, we licensed it, this in from, from AbbVie. Uh, they put it in over 5,300 chronic kidney disease patients, uh, which is a, a huge amount. Um, they included four phase twos, uh, as well as a large phase three. Um, and across these studies, they did show, um, especially in the phase three, they showed um, preservation of kidney function, preventing patients going on to dialysis, onto transplant, uh, all with a, a, a well-characterized and, and, and good safety profile. Um, what gets us the most excited, and, and this is one of the graphs from one of the phase two trials, um, is there's a rapid and sustained impact on protein reduction. Uh, this is showing uh, a, about a 35% reduction in this particular trial, uh, but consistently it's been a 30 to 35% reduction in protein area. And as we talked about a few slides ago, that is the most important driver for IgA nephropathy, and that is the primary endpoint that we're uh, shooting for in our phase three trial, which we just initiated recently. So we have a high degree uh, of conviction that uh, this is going to be a, a program that will provide benefit for patients with IgA nephropathy. Uh, next slide, slide, please, Eric. Um, so 1301, uh, as Eric mentioned, is uh, the, the asset that uh, is in phase one right now for IgA nephropathy. This is another extremely exciting mechanism and program uh, going after these disease. Uh, from a very simple way of thinking about it is April is a molecule in the body that drives the creation and promotes survival of cells that produce IgA. Um, and so when you think about that um, pathophysiology or the mechanism of, of disease in IgA nephropathy, we think that inhibiting April will then reduce the amount of IgA in the body, uh, which will hopefully promote uh, better outcomes for, for patients. Um, these are results of a healthy volunteer study that we um, uh, reported last year. Uh, that study, we saw everything we wanted to see. We saw um, uh, very well tolerated with no serious uh, adverse effects. Um, the pharmacological profile looked extremely promising, uh, a long half-life, 33 days. So we hope that there's uh, suitable and convenient dosing for patients as we move forward. Um, but most importantly, uh, we did see reductions in free April. Um, so we are actually knocking down the target that we want to, which is something you want to show in, in an early trial. Um, but then if you look at the actual effect on IgA, uh, which is the most important component, uh, we did consistently see uh, dose-dependent and durable reductions uh, of 50 to 60% uh, with IgA. Um, data we reported this morning, uh, which will be presented over the weekend, uh, if you look more specifically in this trial uh, at that apparently glycosylated IgA. So those are the disease causing uh, antibodies that are missing that sugar. Uh, there were as similar, if not greater reductions uh, in, in, in that level uh, of, of disease causing um, um, IgA. So, so extremely exciting. Uh, there were similar reductions in IgM, um, but nicely we saw uh, lesser reductions in IgG. Um, and IgG is uh, really what's responsible for your protection against infection. Uh, so it looks like it's a, it's a safe window. Uh, so this drug will provide benefit without uh, causing harm. Uh, so another really uh, exciting program that's, that's in our pipeline. Um, next slide, please. Um, am I doing this, Eric, or do you wanna do it? Sure, I'll, I'll do it. I think I wanna yeah. make sure we have time for Q&A. So yeah. I, I think I mentioned already, we're well capitalized um, and we have cash through um, mid 2023 based on our, our current uh, assets. Uh, and uh, from a catalyst point of view, we've achieved a number of things already in the first half of this year, and we have some additional data coming up on BIAN 1301 at both ERA EDTA and at ASN. So ERA EDTA is in June and ASN is in early November generally. And then we're continuing to move forward with uh, getting our 336 program into the clinic. So a lot going on at the company, a lot to execute on across these three lead programs. Uh, we think there's a huge opportunity here to build the leading company in this space. I'd like to do with Chinook what we did with Seattle Genetics, where we used a combination of partnerships and internal drug development to build a company with a really strong pipeline from all the way from research through to commercial. And we think we're well on our way there. After only being in business for about two years, we've created a, a company that's uh, really going to be making a difference in kidney disease. 
So that is the end of the presentation. I'll turn it back to John and I'll stop sharing slides. <laughs> well, thank you both. Um, and uh, by the way, if you're uh, uh, looking in, we've got an addition to uh, the team on here, Nicole Lefic, uh, who is the Director of uh, uh, Investor Relations at Chinook. Um, just if you're wondering what that uh, the other uh, beautiful <laughs> person, uh, the, actually the, the one beautiful person, it just doesn't <laughs> Um, but thank you, Nipur, for also jumping on. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm truly excited about your story, and I've spoken to so many people about you uh, over the course of when I discovered the situation was last summer. And, and as many of you know that are on the call, and maybe some of you don't, um, this company went public, Chinook went public um, onto the NASDAQ through a process called rever reverse merger. And they reverse merged with a company called Aduro. Uh, that was also in the biotech space, and they successfully merged in the fall of 20, uh, 2020 here, so not too long ago. And it's been, as Eric said, they've, they've gone through this uh, amazing sort of meteoric, I guess, star-like sort of move over the last two years, and, and then found an opportunity to go public, seized it, and they went public also with the blessing of some of the smartest biotech investors on the planet. Eco R1 um, is one of them. Um, maybe you guys could offer uh, a little bit more explanation as to that breadth of institutional base that you own. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just speaking to that quickly, uh, it's a multi multiple people been asking about uh, your- Yeah, you know, absolutely. So we, we're backed by, um, uh, by Versing Ventures, Apple Tree Partners, Samsara Biocapital and Morningside. Those were all investors in either Chinook or Duro prior to the merger. And then at the same time that we did the merger, we, um, we did a $115 million financing led by EcoR1 and Orbimed, Fidelity participated, Rock Springs, and a number of other uh, really strong investor groups. And then since then, we've had some other groups establishing um, positions in the open market. So we've had really strong institutional participation in our in our stock. We also have eight analysts covering us already, which is pretty amazing after only being public for six months and, and some from some really great banks too. So I think the markets are waking up to the potential in kidney disease um, and really welcoming a company that has multiple products for really large unmet needs. And we have we have actual data. You know, there's a lot of companies that have gone public lately with preclinical data only. We have clinical data across our lead programs and, and really think that there's a huge opportunity here and a lot of upside uh, for Chinook. Great, great, thank you. Um, the other question in regards to ownership is to what degree uh, do the insiders own uh, stock at this point? I know the stock, you know, you've moved up in valuation fairly well, but uh, can you speak to that and to what your ownership and involvement is? Yeah, I mean, there really hasn't been any any selling uh, from insiders uh, to speak of. And I think the management team probably owns about 10%. Um, and then if you include our venture capitalists who are on the board, it, it, it gets up to probably in the 40 to 50% range through insider ownership. So it's a strong uh, base of insiders. And, and, you know, I think if anything, you know, there's an interest in, in maintaining or even increasing that because we do see that the uh, upside here in terms of the valuation of the company uh, and going forward. Agreed. Um, uh, Nafur, maybe you can address this for us. Um, the breadth of uh, eight analysts that cover Chinook, what, what is, uh, is there, could you give us sort of the price target range that those analysts have given? I think it's quite substantial from where we're trading today. We've retreated back and in all fairness, the, uh, the biotech indexes outside of the last two days have been come, come, ba come back recently. Um, and so, uh, but I know that they have, I think we're in the $14 range today. Uh, can you speak to that quickly, uh, the analyst and maybe highlight, you know, a couple of the names that are covering you? Yeah, absolutely. We have strong support from, from eight different banks um, and our analysts are, have high conviction in the programs that we're developing. So their models not only include our lead asset, Atrocent 10, which is in phase three, it also includes Bion 1301. And some have actually included our preclinical asset tech 336 as well. So our average price target at this time is around $32 across mm -hmm. all eight analysts. And uh, the banks that are covering us range from, we have a small Canadian bank called Bloom Burton, um, as well as Cantor, William Blair, Evercore, 
uh, SVB Learing, Oppenheimer, Wainwright, um, and I, I hope I'm not missing anything. Wedbush. <laughs> and Wedbush. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, you've got great coverage um, for being public for such a short time. Uh, and you got great institutional ownership here. And, uh, you know, what excited me originally was seeing this company come together with the concentration in this seriously unmet need in this in kidney diseases and, uh, and being able to invest into an asset that has some late stage uh, nature to it at this stage and being like you said, uh, uh, being well funded into 2023. Um, so, and with a number of milestones between now and then uh, to, to, uh, to shoot for and to exceed. So I'm excited to be an investor. As many of you know, I'm invested. I, I run uh, also Vista Partners, which is my registered investment advisor and for full disclosure. And by the way, you know, disclosures are at Tribe Public, as you know, and also at Vista Partners, um, uh, you know, but uh, you can learn a lot more. We do have a dedicated page of Vista Partners too. Many of you may have know that already uh, on Chinook. It's in, in our VP watch list there as well. I would invite you to, to start doing even further due diligence there and uh, check the filings, financials, all those things, confirm everything. And uh, we're periodically writing stories on the company to help people understand what's going on here. I think truly, uh, as people start to discover this company, they're going to be uh, pretty amazed at what they have in the breadth. Uh, and I, I believe, and I can't speak for the institutions that invested, but knowing many of them um, uh, over the years, they don't throw around $115 million too lightly, and they do their homework. And they, they partner with good management teams that have uh, what they believe to be a, a great programs and they look for, you know, not making a few cents. They look at making, you know, many, you know, dollars with many zeros after that over time. And they invest through and, and get companies funded for a couple of years to allow them to, to develop. Um, I think there's going to be opportunities to, to see. And uh, as the company's already done, as met the milestones they've already set out in the short time they've been public. Uh, so they're building trust uh, in the community. And, uh, you know, guys, I really want to thank you for being on here today. Um, and I'll look to circle with you soon. And hopefully we'll get you back on here sometime in the near future. And um, is there anything that, Eric, uh, that you'd like to part with before we sign off today? I don't think so. I mean, we do think this is a, a huge unmet need. And we've got a number of assets that could really benefit patients. And um, Kidney disease is really starting to emerge as a, a promising therapeutic area. It really hasn't been on people's radar until recently, but there's a number of drugs that are moving forward, and um, there's you know really strong um, market potential for a number of our drugs. So we're excited to tell you more as we continue to make progress. Thank, thank you again for taking time from your busy days. Again, uh, everyone, uh, probably within a couple hours here, I'll look to get this video up. Uh, on our uh, Tribe Public YouTube channel and get this out to everyone. So if you've uh, you know came in through part of it or what have you, or for some of your colleagues would like to, to view and, and go through the PowerPoint and the video, it'll be up there soon. And uh, thanks again for attending and look forward to having you guys all in the next program and continue to add to your wish list. If again, if you want to have Chinook back on here soon, send us, express your interest through this, the wish list program at tribepublic.com. And uh, thanks again. Have a great uh, rest of the week, uh, Team Chinook. Thank you. Bye, John. Thanks, Bye. John.